We are live, ladies and gentlemen. It's the Indie Spotlight, the No Name Cinema Society. That is us, the No Name Cinema Society. Here with our Indie Spotlight. And hi, my name is Jonathan Betzler. I am live from Los Angeles, California. Back, hockey beard in full effect here, and uh, we are spotlighting indies from 2012. That is all throughout 2017. We'll be looking at indies from five years ago uh, and spotlighting films that we don't think that you may have seen. And tonight we've got a Best Picture nominee from 2012. It was a Best Foreign Language Film winner. It's called Amour. And it is our indie spotlight for tonight. And that's A-M-O-R. Uh, 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 now I messed it up. It's A-M-O-U-R. It's French, everybody. Uh, Amour. And uh, I've got my colleagues with me. Um, who am I going to introduce first? Let's go with Drunk Davey. How you feeling, Drunk Davey? Feel good. Feel good. Do you know what movie we're doing tonight? Yeah, it's uh, Amour. It's Amour. And also, I've got with me Jay Money. How you doing, Jay? Oh, fine. Too sober yet, though. It's Amour. How is your first... How, what are you drinking tonight? I'm drinking more cheap beer. More cheap beer out of a fine glass. Beer. And I've got uh, a cheap wine out of a cheap glass. So it's all... It, it, you know, it's all for a full circle. <laughs> Hmm. Good cab salve, though I have to admit. Cab salve. That's 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 what cool wine drinkers uh, call Cabernet Sauvignon. So just this is what you know, happens. It's, you move to LA. I'm and educating. Um, I'm educating you. Also, I don't know if you guys know this, but this is our 40th uh, indie. Is that crazy? Wow. This is the 40th indie spotlight. Um, so here I've got a chart of the indies for episode 31 through 40. So starting with Tyrannosaur there at the top, all the way down through uh, a more t this evening, 31 through 40. Every 10 ones, we, we should, you know, do a little retrospective. Guys, is there any among these 10 that uh, that really stands out to you? I know uh, we did our top five indies from 2011 last sound off, so I know Drive is the one that, that you respond to, Davy Joe. Yeah. <laughs> and, and for you, Jay Money, I believe uh, number 32 up there, A Separation was your favorite. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, okay, I'll take that, a separation. Where is, where, where is Melancholia? Melancholia is not outside, the, it's not in the 10, right? It's outside the 10? It, yeah, well, it's not in front of you on this list, so it's, yeah, that's episode 29. <laughs> well, you know I can't see anything anyway, so. Uh, well, that's right, you're a little blind, I yeah. forgot. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> anyway, guys, you got to <laughs> pay closer attention to the graphics that are on the screen. The audience <laughs> will think you see it. No, I don't, I don't want um, to well, I, I, don't want, I don't want to show you what's it's, it's just a rule of thumb. It's true. He doesn't watch the show. And as you may have seen, here's our schedule for the, uh, the this group of shows. Tonight, we're about to do Amour um, from director Michael Haneke. And our classic, our upcoming classic, Disney's Mary Poppins from 1964. We're going to open a can of worms on that. And that's going to be in four days. Our next sound off, which is our freeform segment. And we're going to do our top five films from 1966. And we're going to uh, we're going to do a first, something we've never done before. We're actually going to review a script of a major feature film coming out before it comes out. So that's uh, that's kind of exciting. You guys excited about that? Oh yeah, yeah. Let's dig into it. Our very first script review. Um, so the trivia uh, tidbit uh, for Amor uh, on the last episode and on Facebook, the trivia was that two international screen legends come together, and those. International screen legends from Amour are obviously Jean-Louis Trintignant, um, who was in one of our 1966 films, as you may recall. Of course, one of his most famous films is A Man and a Woman, which is the foreign language film winner from 1966, and he was a man and a man and a woman. He's also, of course, in And God Created Woman, uh, Z, The Conformist, a uh, great career for Jean-Louis Trintignant. Emmanuel Riva's most famous film is Alan Renee's Hiroshima Mon Amour. Uh, from 1961. And of course, Emmanuel Riva was a Best Actress nominee in 2012 for this film. So, you know, big time international screen legends finally coming together for this movie. So that was that was a trivia tidbit. Um, are you guys ready for the summary as I mull right along? Yeah, hit us. Hit us with yeah. that hot sum. <laughs> that, that's, is that a math joke? Hit us with that hot sum? Nope. I literally think it's hot. It's burning me up right now. I'm waiting for it. <laughs> okay. Amour. Georges and Anne are an elderly couple living in Paris. When Anne has a stroke, their multi-decade relationship is put to the test as they try to deal with the ugly aftermath, including Anne's paralysis on one side of her body, as well as her lack of desire to continue living. How was that summary, gentlemen? Good. Pretty good. It was brief. I, I tried to keep it brief. I think it I, was... Yeah, go ahead. 
It's good. You think you think it was what? Uh oh, here it comes. I'll tell you, I, I, before we had a movie, we're so brief, huh? You're getting a little taste of Davy Joe's opinion. Um, he was waiting for a crack. Um, this is my recommendation, though. It's the second of three 2012 indies that made my top ten that year. I grant you, Davy, it's a difficult movie to watch, albeit for me in a very satisfying way. Um, I think it's a JB kind of character-driven movie. That's that's my thing. Um, mm -hmm. I think it, it has very specific directorial choices that are artful and poignant, uh, including long takes that allow the actors to move freely within the frame, and therefore the actors can be a little more natural. And the result is outstanding performances across the board, in my humble opinion. The film is also evocative and interesting because it has ambiguous symbolism that I think is challenging without being forced. I acknowledge it's super slow, which I love that pace. First time I watched it, I watched it again uh, just last night after a really long day. And uh, admittedly, it was a little more challenging and maybe more of a mindset thing. I, initially, I thought it was hypnotic. This time, you know, I, I was struggling uh, a little bit. I was, I was fading. All right, Davy Joe, you have a history of hating old people in movies. In episode 13.2, um, <laughs> uh, about the movie about two older gentlemen on a trip to Iceland, you, uh, you really laid into them. And Land Ho was the name of the movie, episode 13.2. You can see Davy Joe whining about that. So Davy Joe, what are your thoughts on Amour? Well, it's not, it's not that bad. Um... It's, it's not land for that. <laughs> if only that were a, that were a mark on the Davies film. Not that bad. Maybe it should be. Not as bad as land hoe. Not as bad uh, as land hoe. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, what was the question? Your opening <laughs> thoughts. Is that all you got? Not as bad as land hoe? No, I, I thought uh, I thought ultimately uh, the performances are great, but the movie is just sort of manipulative and, and not um, particularly uh, interesting to me. Wow. Some explosive comments from Davy Joe. Jay Money, opening thoughts. No, uh, before I start, actually, Jay Money, uh, Jay Money is actually the opposite of Davy Joe in the sense that he does have a history of liking movies with old people. His number three film, if you look at our top ten from 2015, his number three film was a film called 45 Years. Jay Money, you love senior citizens. What did you think of Amore? Uh, I liked it. I certainly liked it a lot more than Davy Joe. Uh, I liked it <laughs> primarily because it was uh, one of uh, it had one of the best properties I love in movies in general. Uh, JB, I believe you know what that is. Bleakness. Bleakness. That's right. This is bleak with a capital B in a realistic way, and I really appreciated that. <laughs> you know, one of the things I talked about in my uh, thing was the was the direction. Um, so I, I let's talk about the pace, Davy Joe. Like you, was it painful for you? Yeah, um, but you know, it, I, I don't, I don't, I, I, it's, as long as there's something for me to, to, to kind of latch on to, I don't, I don't need a fast pace. I mean, 45 years was not a fast movie. I enjoyed that quite a bit. Um, I just, I just, it wasn't, there wasn't any, there wasn't any. Even though, me. even though it had old people? You liked it even though it had old people? Yeah, yeah. No, it's, uh, <laughs> it's terrible. Uh, I, I am, I am. <laughs> uh, no, it's. He it's, likes uh, Armenians though, but he hates them. Anyway, no, I, I, the pacing is 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 tough because there's no there's nothing to nothing nothing for me to, to kind of latch onto and get interested in. Um, Jay Money, I like the methodical pace. Where are you at? Yeah, I'm with you on that. I I, I guess, but you know, the thing is, for me, I, I appreciate it more in hindsight. I, I think that I didn't necessarily enjoy the process of watching the film so much while I was doing it. That's okay with me. I, I don't necessarily have to enjoy the process while I'm enjoying the film because I think ultimately. The pace was so deliberate, and because of the way that it functioned to sort of like, the movie itself is about watching this relationship sort of decay, and, and watching everything around these, and these people's lives sort of fall apart. It made a lot of sense. You feel like the relationship decays? I don't want to open up a can of worms there. I don't know if the, the relationship decays so much. Like, I don't think that their connection decays. I think it actually is, goes in the opposite direction for me. That's my interpretation. Yeah, I, I don't mean that their their uh, amour decays so much. Is that I mean like their lifestyle, their their life around themselves has decayed excessively, and you're watching all the sort of the niceties of their life. And I think the movie itself goes out its way to show you how nice their life is initially, how like comfortable it is. You you sort of watch it all get stripped and torn away, and it's 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 watching that which is painful, but it's also that's the point. You know, that's the, that's the whole journey of this film in general. So I, I appreciated that. Um. I mean, other directorial things that I that I really like that that I you know I'll rattle off real quick is that I mean I love I love long takes. I mean I talked about it a little bit, you know, um, uh, and the, the, sometimes with camera movement, sometimes not. Sometimes they just put a camera in a corner and let the actors move around, and that felt very real and natural to me and on tone. 
Uh, I thought that some of the, and some of the framing was great. Like, uh, you know, I love the way they use frames within a frame a lot. And, and also the way they use off screen space because it never felt like the actors were blocked for the camera. And there was something very freeing and refreshing about that. Those directorial choices, where are you guys on those things? Yeah, I, I, well, I, I guess to your point, I think that he was, uh, the director was letting these uh, uh, really professional, renowned actors do their thing in their own space. It was great that he, at least that's my impression, JB, you might have a different impression, but it seemed like he was kind of letting them work with material in their own way, partly because it's, it's relevant for them <laughs> in a lot of ways, and partly because it seemed like he was giving over the reins of the idea to them. He was giving over the reins of these characters to them to just sort of explore and, and you know, work within their, their own sort of like, um, basically bottled space. I mean, it's, it's ultimately a movie that takes place, that could be a, a play for that matter. It's a movie that takes place in a very limited space, uh, spatial area. So it's it's interesting to see how uh, they play against that. Davy Joe, would more cuts have added to, and which would have added to the pace, have added to your enjoyment? No, no, not at all. It's, it's what, what, what the problem was that they, I, there wasn't any development. I never got, um, I, I never got interested in characters and I never, you know, you know, there just wasn't like I said. It was just, I, just, I just found the whole thing completely uninteresting. I think I think a lot of cuts would have just been distracting and, and weird and, and out of place. That's interesting. You never got interested in the characters. Um, I, I mean, like I admittedly though, I do think this is a director's movie. Like I don't even have a uh, in my outline a, a, a screenplay section. I almost always do, but I don't think of this as a movie that's written. Like, it feels, like, so directed to me, like, with all the specific choices. And, I mean, like, if there was a screenplay, I don't know how much attention was paid to it. Because, honestly, it doesn't, like, a lot of the things that they say don't matter. Like, every once in a while, you get a, beast, a little bit of exposition, like, what actually happens to her. Like, you know, like, you get some medical information. But other than that, the rest of it doesn't really matter. It, like, the specifics of what they're saying. Um, it was, unless it's one of George's stories that are sort of, you know, part of the symbolism part. Was, was the director also the writer? I think I, I thought I saw that. He's a co-writer. You're going to love his work. He's back in Cannes this year with another film that I meant to look up before the show, but I forgot. A film that stars Isabel Huppert as well, who's also in this film. Mm -hmm. And so he's back in Cannes this year. Uh, we'll see if he wins again. And he's known for Bleak, so he's your kind of guy. All right. You know, it's, it's Bleak, but it's also Bleak in a French way, so it makes a lot of sense. It, it was, in a lot of ways to me, it was a very French film. It was a very existentialist it was exploring a really sort of like simplistic, uh, you know, area. It was not like full of uh, frills. It was down to the core in terms of like dealing with emotional issues, but it was quiet. It was silent. It was a lot of like interpretation. So, uh, you know, it's uh, it it was satisfying in a in a terrible way. And I'm kind of surprised that David Joe didn't connect with it actually, because I also feel like the subject matter in general is something that maybe all three of us have thought about to some degree, given our families. So. I'm surprised. I to me, that was a big thing for me, certainly. I, I would yeah. think it might be for you guys too as well. But I mean, I definitely, I definitely, I, I will, actually, I'm going to rephrase, and I, I definitely connected with him at the very minimum. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm surprised Davy Joe did not. Yeah, I, well, I mean, there wasn't, I mean, I know he told some stories about his, his past. I, it's just, I never, I needed, I needed a little bit more uh, to, to, to get invested. Well, I mean, in all fairness, you do have, uh, you know, a hollow area where the heart should be. So that you know, that probably had something to do with it as well. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so what did you think, uh, David Joe, about all those things I said about the direction, like the framing, the long takes? You can almost take any uh, scene of the film, view it in isolation, and think that it's it's great. It's just the in total... It's just, just a slog. I'm curious what you thought about the structure, you know, especially the way the film began. It began at the end to some degree. And, and also at, at different points, um, it sort of played with reality versus imagination. Like th those moments, did they bother you at all? Like, or you know what I mean? Because that, that, that is part of the, what I think the makes the film evocative. But I mean, without connecting with it is, you know, like, did that bother you then? Uh, no, you know what? No, it did, it didn't bother me. I you know I, I think that um, I just it just felt it, it didn't feel like it was coming from anywhere for me. I I, I guess I didn't. Um, I you know early in early in the film was it was a time that uh, you know it kind of getting back to what Jay Money said. Um, you know he said that they, it kind of set up you know how their life was before, and I I, I I guess I needed a little more of that. 
So, you know, when you see the nightmare, it didn't, didn't land for me. I hadn't uh, invested in, in the characters at all. Right. And the fact that you knew that how it was going to end, did that decrease from your investment by chance? No, I look, and I mean, uh, ultimately, it's pretty obvious where this thing's going uh, early on. I guess it's, it's where we're all going. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> well, um, okay, no. well, let me, let, me, let, me, let me run you my favorite uh, scene here, um, talking about the reality versus imagination thing here. Now, let, let's take a look at this scene and see if it opens up any conversation. So guys, there you can see, like, it's super subtle with this idea of reality versus imagination. And then the very end, we know what, where she really is, but then she's still there. Um, you know, and, and, and what we love about foreign films sometimes, particularly French films, is, uh, and, and the bad films take this to an extreme, but their, their lack of interest in force feeding us information. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a delicate balance, clarity, and... You know, we, we kind of like ambig ambiguity sometimes. And even on this show, when we talked about Killer Joe in the last city spotlight, you know, ambiguity was the order of the day and we, we appreciated that. Um, I think that's the case here. And I love, I mean, this is, we get this idea that, and this is a very brief piano scene, but I think it's beautiful and very evocative. Uh, and I, this, this to me makes me feel emotional. I mean, like this shows his insight into his brain, I think. And that's what makes me care about him. I, I, I guess, I guess, you know, that, that, that scene is, is, is deep into the, into the film. And, and, and by then I had, I don't know, I, I just, I, I, I was, I was He's ready. Hopeless. I was ready Money, what do you think? to end. No, what do you think about this use of reality versus imagination? Uh, well, in the, both in this scene and the conclusion, what do you think? Uh, you know, I think that it, it was, uh, it was definitely a nice, it was a nice way to sort of spark a little more interest into this. Um, I think that, you know, to David Joe's point, um, you know where this movie is going to go. And I, and I think that probably part of the reason that David Joe maybe struggled with it so much is because it's over two hours and you know ultimately where the conclusion is going to happen. And you would know that even if it didn't start the way it did. You think you would know kind of like the point of it. But the way that it did start to me is actually very interesting because getting back to the, the sort of subtle, fan, you know, fantastical elements that we're talking about here, uh, JB, yeah, the beginning is it's very cut and dry and it sort of explains uh, ultimately where things are happening. But there also is a mystery in the beginning and it does tie into a bit of a mystery at the end. And that Absolutely. actually made me really appreciate that. But the, like when I first, when, when we were watching, when I was watching it the first time, when I was watching it recently, uh, I was sort of like, I don't know why they bothered to show us that initially. And then by the end of it, I, I understood that it, as much as they were saying, here's a definitive you know, conclusion to something, it was also opening a door to another part of the mystery in a, in a certain way. So it actually made a lot of sense. And mm -hmm. I like the fact that they kept doubling back on what was reality. I mean, there are a couple of really obvious scenes where it's not reality. You know, there's a, there's a dream sequence, obviously, and there's him daydreaming and stuff. There's also some things that happen in the movie that, uh, that may or may not be reality. I don't know, for instance, right. what the bird the is in a, in a lot of ways. It could or could not have happened. The letter, the pigeon, like both those things, like did they happen? Did they not happen? Right, right. So, so it, it that, and I really appreciate that. I really appreciate the way that it brought in, I guess what I would say is a French touch or a European touch to this kind of uh, otherwise, you know, pretty straightforward uh, bleak storytelling. Yeah, uh, Davy Joe, I was going to move on, but you look like it's something you wanted to say. You know, there was one scene that I, I did really like a lot in this film, and I actually uh, backed it up and watched it again. Uh, the, the first scene with the pigeon, I <laughs> Okay, that's a good segue, because I did want to talk about the symbolism of the film. Uh, there's a number of things that I think 
as the timer goes off, so we're going to have to wrap it up soon. But there's a number of things that I thought were very well integrated, sim symbolic gestures. Um, the pigeons one, the letters another, the door to Jay Mo what Jay Money was talking about. When we're back in present day as opposed to the future or, or the past, depending on how you look at it. When George first walks into the apartment after the concert, there's an issue with the door, which sort of connects to how the door is broken open in the very beginning, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I think that's, you know, combination of symbolism and foreshadowing. I'm not sure, there's a lot of doors in this movie. I'm not sure what they all represent. I think George's stories are highly symbolic in ways that I haven't completely put together. And I wanted to yeah. see if you guys, I have a theory on the pigeon. I don't really completely understand the letter, the door, George's stories, or the or, um, you know, what exactly the ending represents, meaning, you know, George's escape, if you will. Um, where, do you guys have any insight into those things and I, or the pigeon? Because I can tell you my theory on the pigeon before we go. I would, I'm, I'm really interested in your theory on the pigeon. I just I just love the way that the scene was executed. I thought it was kind of interesting how they managed it's, to- It's beautiful, it's beautiful and lyrical. Yeah. Um, well, Jimmy thinks, I'll just say, I believe the pigeon to me is uh, symbolic of, of because he had just done something rather drastic, uh, depending on how you look at it, yeah. that sort of is like, um, it's it, you know the pigeon represents nature to me, and his the way he captured the pigeon is is controlling nature, and the way he sort of like forcibly controlled nature in the scene or two right before that. So I mean, like that's sort of how I see, and you know, there's a second appearance of the pigeon, and the first time he releases the pigeon. Um, and the second time he doesn't. And I think that sort of is representative of his journey of, uh, of how, he, you know, he sort of needed to force nature's hand, uh, in, you know, as far as his wife was concerned. Um, so that's what I thought that represented. I don't know how you guys feel about that. I, I thought that that was really interesting. Jay <laughs> <Jim>, Money. <laughs> <laughs> I like that theory. I, I I don't think I actually thought about it that way, but I think that, that what you're saying actually it makes a lot of sense. Um, I almost thought of it as as the pigeon itself became a third character in their apartment, and and the pigeon became complicit in the idea of what was going on. And I often thought that it maybe represented in some ways uh, his wife's spirit in a in a sense that it was, you know, something that was sort of trapped and then trying to be let go. So I feel like uh, you know the first time he encounters it, it's an issue that he's trying to resolve. It's it's a problem that he's trying to fix. Ultimately. I know, but I mean, like it's weird because it almost seems like then it would be reversed. Well, the first time he's trying to fix it, the second time he's trying to hold on to it, even though he's kind of, you know, because he is, he's just gone through this process where he has let go of something. So it's almost yeah. like to me, the first time it's a nuisance. The second time it's it's him fulfilling this emotional need that he realizes that he, you know, he has now. Um, but the other thing that struck me is that, you know, birds in general are symbols of, of sort of messengers of death. So I, I kind of thought that that might be something, certainly some foreshadowing with the way that the bird came in around her at one point, I think, or I don't the first think time all her. birds are symbols of messengers and death. I think that's a different bird scenario. I'll have to check with my no, expert. No, bird, birds in general. Birds in general definitely are. I mean, I, I don't know about a pigeon specifically, but I mean, you know, but it's okay. not just like a crow or a raven, for instance. It's, it's a variety um, of birds. David, do, you have, do you have a preference of those theories? Um, <laughs> that's always going to be a competition. About the bird being a, 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 a harbinger. Uh, I don't. I mean, here's. Yeah, I don't know. Necessarily, we need any foreshadowing. Uh, you know, like like we said, we all kind of know where this thing's. Uh, where we're where, where, where we're flying. Uh, so. Uh, See what he did there, folks. See what he did there. Uh, I, <laughs> I'll go with. I'll go with your uh, nature. Uh, oh, nice. All right, gold star that's, for that's me. Not all what I was saying, Davy Joe. Thanks for paying attention. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, all right, guys, we gotta go. But I mean, like. Uh, 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 thirty seconds on the performances. Uh, great. I, and, they were great. Can I say it was a real shame? I mean, I, I looked them up on IMDb. It's, it was. It's sad to see that Manuel Manuel would leave. Manuel, you know, yeah. Uh, passed away in, in in January. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I mean, she made this film five years before you know things unfortunately happened for her, and it just again it struck me that they you know they had to have been thinking so much about this as they were going through this the film itself, and that had to have really played into their performance, and it, it felt very genuine to me. A lot of things yeah. that they talked about in this felt very genuine. Um, I thought her physicality was outstanding. She got the Oscar nomination, but to me, it's his movie. It's his journey, and he's so subtle. I, the, those stories he performs, which I haven't quite pieced, I don't have a theory in those stories yet exactly and how that ties into the greater narrative, but the, they're eloquently performed, those stories. Yeah, um, I, I think he, it's a master performance, uh, you know, on his part. And Isabel Pair is always, always good. Sort of a, a two-dimensional character for her, though. Mm. We got the most background on her, though. I thought. Not that it was particularly compelling. But I mean, like, you're, I think you're, you're applying narrative 
criteria to this film that's not exactly that. I mean, I, am I out of the line? Not what it's for is probably why I didn't like it. Yeah, you're, you're not wrong. <laughs> You're not. I guess you're just not the audience for this. But I, I mean, it's it's definitely a, an accomplished movie. The other thing that I that I would have loved to talk more about. We never get to talk about it. We talked about it a little bit with Brief Encounter. But I, the sound of the this movie was was the sound design was I think was extraordinary. Um, particularly the silences were very loud. Uh, you know, in 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 a, and I say that in a very positive way. And you have to see the movie to know what I understand. But every sound is amplified because it's so quiet. Whether it's her rolling over in bed, or her hair being brushed by a nurse, or water from the tap, or a pen to a paper when he's writing the letter, it's, that 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 sound is so uh, present, and and it, it feels, you know, like the, the sound is part of the storytelling tools being used. Also, the use of music. As these are music teachers, I think is is uh, very evocative as well. Um, Ten seconds on that, guys. Sorry about to rush you, but I'm trying to keep things tight here. Yep, sounds a really really crucial part of the whole film. Uh, I guess from everything you're talking about here. So, so you agree? Yeah, absolutely. David, can you at least acknowledge that? Sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> He's, that's him trying to shut me up. Um, the next indie we're going to do, uh, you know, uh, so the little backstory tidbit for the indie is three friends meet at an East Coast university. They start collaborating there, um, and then they move to L.A. Uh, one indie success after another, and now they have a huge Netflix hit. Um, next week's indie is the 2012 offering from this triumvirate of colleagues. Um, and our next show is coming up this week. Um, we're going to go Disney, and we're going to do Mary Poppins. So we will see you then.